Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, uh, I am C. Everett Koop, Surgeon General for seven years when uh, Ronald Reagan was President and one year with George Bush Sr. My remarks come from the vantage point of 26 years of close observation of the office and of its mission. I strongly believe that the Surgeon General must be independent and free to advise the nation on how it can prevent disease and promote good health. He or she should be the health educator for Americans par excellence. The consensus of the excuse me at the same time the Surgeon General should be an important cog in the machinery that directs public health in the United States and I acted in these capacities. In addition to working within the United States, I served for eight years as our nation's representative to the World Health Organization. The consensus of the representatives of other nations for my role was something like this. What a wonderfully appropriate position. I wish we had such an office and such a person. The personalities of two individuals have much to do with the success of the Surgeon General. First, the President of the United States. Mr. Reagan was pressed to fire me every day, largely because of my work on AIDS, but he would not interfere. If he had not been the kind of person he was, I would not be here today. Second, the Secretary of HHS. On a day-to-day -day basis, the Secretary is the most influential person in determining the effectiveness of the Surgeon General. I served under four. The last one was Dr. Otis Bowen, a three-time governor of Indiana, a medical doctor, and a fine gentleman. When I was writing the Surgeon General's report on AIDS and the later mailing sent to every household in America, he was a constantly uh, supporter gentleman. It was Otis Bowen who insisted that I sign the documents in question myself. I asked Otis Bowen to keep the contents of these two reports close to his chest. I promised to do the same. In addition to the two of us, only two staffers were privy to the contents. We maintained strict secrecy from the day we began to write until we presented the finished product 17 drafts later and released them to the press. If we had followed the protocol and every word was scrutinized, these reports, because of their nature and plain speaking, I am sure would not have seen the light of day. The Secretary of Health and Human Services can use the talents of the Surgeon General or ignore them. In that regard, my successors were less fortunate than I. Over the years since I left office, I've observed a worrisome trend of less than ideal treatment of the Surgeon General, including undermining his authority at times when his role and function seemed abundantly clear. If I had been impeded in my duties, as some of my successors were, here are some of the things that would never have happened. Eight reports to Congress on smoking and health might not have been published. The knowledge of the addiction of tobacco because of its nicotine content might have been suppressed. We might have still had smoking on airplanes. Changes in Title V of the Social Security Act entitling special needs children to comprehensive family-centered, community-based care might not have happened either. Assurance during the Tylenol scare would have been missing, leading to panic and possibly market upheaval. Revision of the health care agreements with the People's Republic of China, the Soviet Union, and Kuwait might not have occurred. The only federal government report on nutrition might not have been published, and many, many more the time does not permit to tell. Clearly, the Surgeon General must be free to serve the American people without political interference. It is also vital that future Surgeons General have the necessary support and resources to do their job. We can ensure this. How can we ensure that this happens? First, I believe that the Surgeon General should not be a political appointment. In my opinion, the Surgeon General should be named by the President from a panel selected by the Promotions Committee of the Commission Corps of the United States Public Health Service. This was once the protocol, and it served our country well for nearly a hundred years. It remains today the protocol used to appoint the Surgeons General of the Army, Navy, and the Air Force. 
Second, the Surgeon General must have secure funding to do his work. The security of a four-year appointment doesn't mean much if you can't be easily, if you can be easily denied the resources you need to do your job. Therefore, I recommend that Congress annually appropriate funding on a line item basis to the Office of the Surgeon General. In closing, let me say, Mr. Chairman, as you've already mentioned, you are from the beginning one of um, my severest critics to become one of my trusted supporters, and I thank you for that and the excellent job, sir, that you have done in improving the health of the American people. Please continue to exercise oversight of the Office of the Surgeon General and the Commission Corps of the Public Health Service so that they can continue to do their vital work. Thank you, sir.